Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, welcome to New Books Network. I am your host today, Erica Monahan. Today, we are talking about a book, Information, a Historical Companion, published by Princeton University Press in 2021. Information is everywhere. We live in an information society. We can get more information faster, quicker, and in more different shapes and sizes, perhaps, than in any other time in history. Meanwhile, misinformation and disinformation have worked their way into our daily collective lexicon. Like everything, information has a history. And this volume, just shy of 900 pages, comprising 13 historical essays, followed by 100 short, tight pieces that elaborate on particular technologies, practices, um, etc. associated with information is an invaluable reference work to help us or to help us orient ourselves in that history. This project, Information, a Historical Companion, was realized by four editors, Anne Blair, Paul Duguid, Anya Sylvia Guig, and Anthony Grafton. I have the opportunity today to speak with two of those editors. Our guests today, Anne Blair and Tony Grafton know as much as anybody about the history of one of the earliest and most stable means of storing and transmitting information, the book. They have also been paying close attention to how our information ecosystem is evolving in our own day. Anne Blair is a professor of history at Harvard University. She specializes in the cultural and intellectual history of early modern Europe with an emphasis on France. Her most recent book, in fact, was published in the French language last year. She is also the author of Too Much to Know, Managing Scholarly Information Before the Modern Age. You can hear her talk about that work with Terry Gross on NPR's program Fresh Air, which makes her one of the very rare species of early modern historians whose work has found a mainstream audience. Anthony Grafton is a professor of history at Princeton University. He has devoted himself to the reception of classical learning in Renaissance Europe. Professor Grafton has written about 10 books about, he's written over 100 articles for more public facing publications like the New York Review of Books. And he has also served as president of the American Historical Association. He has largely been credited with all but creating the subfield of the history of the book. And one of his more recent books is titled Inky Fingers, The Making of Books in Early Modern Europe. I am thrilled and honored to talk to our guests today. I wanna thank you for joining us. And without further ado, begin. (laughs) Um, It is a convention, a tradition at the New Books Network to start out by asking our authors how you got into history. So I'd like um, to ask you to tell us a little bit about your path into and through the historical profession, please. Um, Tony, since you started first, perhaps we'll start with you. (laughs) Yes, I I did start first a long time ago. And uh, I actually can't remember a time when I wasn't somewhat obsessed by history. Um, I guess the beginning that I remember most vividly is when T.H. White's Once and Future King came out in an American edition. I was probably nine or 10. And a friend of my parents gave me a copy. And I was absolutely fascinated by the vision vivid uh, and you know, wonderfully living portrait of different societies and the skills that hawkers and farmers had, uh, which, which he did absolutely brilliantly. And I was also always obsessed by languages. I badgered my parents to get me lessons in classical Greek. I learned I did more Greek and Latin and French in high school and more in college. And uh, I didn't quite know how this was all going to come together. And then I had the great good Good fortune to take a, a course with uh, a great historian, Hannah Holborn Gray. She later became the president of the University of Chicago. And somehow the Renaissance seemed to be a place where languages and a different world and a different past all came together and I could study them all. And I haven't recovered from that discovery since. Thank you. And you, Anne, please. Well, I too sort of feel like I was always going to be a historian, not quite sure why. Interested in 
the the sort of cliche of the past as a foreign country, the idea that people had such strange ways sometimes of combining ideas and having a, what they thought was a coherent worldview that doesn't make perfect sense to us. And the puzzle of trying to understand that from their perspective, I think, is really a motivator. And one of my challenges was deciding what period to focus on. And uh, the early modern period really seemed like a great way. It looks back to antiquity. It inherits from the Middle Ages, even though it doesn't want to always acknowledge that. And of course, it's also the grounds for comparing with the modern or even the postmodern period. So I feel very fortunate. I had no thought at the beginning about the impact of printing, but of course, what the early modern period has is tons and tons of sources that really no one has looked at. You know, from antiquity in the Middle Ages, the source pool is more narrow and has been generally well studied and edited and so forth. There's still many great discoveries to be made, uh, especially in medieval manuscripts, but early printed books are just legion. And um, discovering that really only confirmed my happiness in being in this sort of period of that's a turning point and uh, full of uncharted regions still. Uh, thank you. I am. Um... Yeah, I've, um, well, for our listeners, we'll be pleased to know that both of you have uh, given a number of lectures on YouTube or whatnot, and that hearing you both talk about books and techniques in more detail than we'll manage to today has been a, is a real treat for me. I learned so much from it, and I really encourage our readers um, to do, our listeners to do some of that as well, and readers. Um, so my next question for you is, why did you do this book project? So I was approached by an editor uh, who wasn't working for Princeton Rissy Press at the time, but then moved to PUP and then has left PUP <laughs> about, wouldn't this be a great idea? And of course, my immediate thought was, oh my gosh, you know, can't possibly tackle this. So uh, no, <laughs> uh, until, you know, basically, I can't remember the next, Tony might remember some next steps until the team became, uh, came into view as something that actually could tackle such a huge, unwieldy, unreasonable topic. Um, so it was a, a suggestion by an editor who I think, you know, reference books as this is are an important growth area. And the history of information is a field that's just getting started. Um, and alongside information studies, of course, which and schools of information, which are their own discipline, often related to library schools or to media studies. So the history of information is um, yeah a, a new a new area a new way of thinking about some of the things we've always been doing and uh, putting things in combination in different ways. So it's been lots of fun, and I'm glad that uh, we said yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Tony, you? Yeah, I have to agree. I think after Anne sort of was dubious, they then came to me thinking I was more gullible. Uh, and I said, well, if Anne and a couple of other people would do it, and they said, oh, a team, yeah, that that could work. And then we uh, we started to, I, I'm Paul Duguid, who was one of our collaborators, happened to be coming through New York at some point, And we sat down and had a talk. And Anne and I both knew him well and loved his work and thought he would be a great part partner. And Anya is also a close friend of ours and uh, very interested in di different aspects of information in the pre-modern world. So it all just seemed like a good team. And uh, we talked to the press. And the other thing that we discovered is Princeton Press was just extraordinarily generous. They supported the project in a wonderful way. They allowed us to bring together the people who um, both advisors and then the people who were going to write the larger articles which appear at the beginning of the book. Um, not everybody, but we and and the hybrid technology was pretty primitive then. So we were we did bring some people in uh, online that didn't work terribly well. You could do that much better now. Uh, but we but we had very productive meetings, which were very intense and very helpful. So we really were the press really allowed us to build this and to bring in people very people with very different views about how the book should be done and take some of their ideas on board. Both of us um, like collaborating, I think, and so the press was not just willing to put the four of us in as a team, but they were willing to let uh, let us build a larger collaboration. 
And that was both a challenge, but also a, a big reward. I had edited, co-edited a previous reference book, The Classical Tradition, which was published by Harvard, and it had a ball doing that. And that was one reason why I thought this would be fun as well. Thanks. Um, yeah, as I've gone through this book, um, my appreciation for it has grown tremendously, um, both in the the writing is is tight. It's readable. You rarely called a nine hundred page book a uh, page turner, but every part of it reads well. There's not an article in here that I thought that was a waste of my time. Um, it, it's all been useful. The articles relate to each other. This format of having this first section of the book that gives you long narrative, and then these short, useful articles, 100 of them on, on various aspects of information history, I found to re- work really well. And it seems to me that we're in this moment when historians are called to reach beyond their fields, collaborate, try and move across disciplines. And it seems to me that it makes, as, as you've indicated, reference books more valuable than ever for uh, scholars that want to stretch. And this is a great book to help people do that. Okay. And um, well, let me here start to get a little bit more in, t- into the book. Tony, the chapter, you're not, you didn't just edit it. You both contributed pieces. And so I'd like to ask you about yours. Tony, your chapter starts out the book. Um, please tell us about it a little. Yeah, my chapter was deliberately designed to make a kind of set of polemical points, which we hope the whole book reinforces. Um, information almost brings with it a sense of, wow, we're talking about the modern world, or we're talking about the contemporary world, or we're talking about literal networks down which um, bits or down which bits of, of information are literally moving. And one of the things we wanted to do, first of all, we wanted to find a reason compass because we knew we couldn't cover the whole of the history of information. And we thought that starting really with uh, in the, the, a kind of medieval world, but not the Western medieval world with Islam and Asia, and then really concentrating on print and onwards, the introduction of print to the West. And after that would make a coherent book and still let us be insistent about the fact that information wasn't born yesterday. So I thought I would do a really florid argument about that and tried. And so I simply took three topics that interested me um, the the sort of the growth of the great trade routes that united um, ancient and medieval civilizations around the Indian Ocean, and uh, the uh, uh, the way in which uh, information, the way in which paper traveled, and finally the way in which um, one empire, the Roman Empire, could be seen as an information society. This was a uh, these were all areas that had been the subject of very intensive work recently. Um, Many of my colleagues in East Asian studies at Princeton have been involved in the great Dunhuang study for this this vast library, which reflects the incredible exchanges of language, religion, trade that were going on in East Asia uh, at an unsuspected early time. Um, Clifford Ando and other Roman historians have really transformed our understanding of the way the empire did things, Walter Seidel. Idell at, at Stanford with his great work on the roads of the Roman Empire. And paper also has been a, a recent study with you know, excellent new books on, say, the, ma- the making and use of paper in the Islamic world. And each of these had, just had a couple of points I wanted to make. The way in which the movement of things is also a movement of information. You can't, when things move, uh, information about what they are, how you use them, how you transport them, has to move with them. So communication has to take place. And it seems to me in the pre-modern world, that's actually one of the chief ways that information travels uh, across the borders of one community to another. In talking about the Roman Empire, 
where I wanted to argue that information has been part of power um, much longer than people often think. That you know the first information states were not um, were you didn't you know it was not the CIA and uh, and its counterpart institutions elsewhere that built the first information states. Um, and finally, with paper, I did want to introduce the notion that information depends you know, in a great part on media. It can't only be oral. And paper is such a fascinating medium and also exemplifies the first two points. It's essential to, um, it's a, it is itself traded. It is itself, it travels with apparently information about how to make it so that Europe learns how to, Western Europe, Christian Europe learns how to make paper from the Islamic world, but somehow becomes more efficient at it so that Islamic theologians have to worry about whether Muslims can use paper that has Christian watermarks. Uh, it's all just a wonderful world of you know much more constant and uh, dialectical communication than traditional accounts of gifts. So my point was really to kind of say, if you're here for just the 21st century, you're actually in the wrong book. Super great. I am, um, as someone who has spent most of my archival time has been reading pieces of paper from the um, center in Moscow out to administrators in Siberia and in the 17th century. And the thing they always asked people, where are you coming from? What did you see there? How is it there? Um, and so that just is a, it, re, it illustrates the point you've just made. Thank you. Um, Anne, please tell us your chapter, Information in Early Modern Europe. There's um, so much <laughs> to, 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 to say about this. So I will just ask you to say, please summarize this for us a bit. Yep, a huge topic. Uh, basically, I tackled sort of the impacts of printing in early modern Europe. Printing, of course, not a unique technology to Europe. We use the same term to describe woodblock printing from East Asia, which was invented centuries before, with typo typographic movable type printing, which was invented in the 1450s by Johannes Gutenberg and Mainz, would have no doubt been invented by other people uh, in similar circumstance if it hadn't been for Gutenberg. Uh, so there isn't any evidence, really, that printing moved across the Silk Road the way paper did. Um, but what's really interesting to me was, first of all, how printing was used, as we called a skeuomorph, you know, to make things that looked like manuscripts. Gutenberg Bible is in Gothic script, it's in black and white, uh, and then you were meant to add rubrication and color just as you would in the medieval manuscript. It's in two columns, which is a format that starts in 13th century Bibles. In other words, it doesn't have a title page, it doesn't have page numbers, it doesn't have various trappings that we associate with the modern book because those took about 50 years basically to become standard. So, um, you know, like any technology, it, it comes out of its context and it tries to look like the old technology. But it's also true what's unique, I'd say, about Europe as compared with um, the impact in East Asia is that it spread very rapidly and commercially, so that most printing is commercial printing from the beginning. It's a speculative operation. A lot of printers get on board and then go broke, you know, as did Gutenberg himself. Um, so it's a, a boom and bust often um, industry, which uh, I think serves two purposes. I try to emphasize how, on the one hand, it makes for quick turnaround of short pieces that can have a, an impact at the time, ephemeral printing, which often doesn't survive very well, pamphlets, single sheets, broadsheets, uh, indulgences, of course, which you know, as one of the causes of uh, of Luther's anger, was not just a theological one, but there were way more indulgences out because of printing. The Catholic Church commissioned, you know, uh, probably up to a million indulgences, of which a few hundred survive in libraries because they were simply, you know, um, reused, junked. They were never bound, so they were very vulnerable. So there's that quick action of print on the one hand, and on the other hand, a desire to produce for all time editions that would preserve texts that had come down from antiquity, discovered by the humanists, for example. Even humanism is a movement starting before printing. But once printing came along, the humanists thought, aha, now we have a way to save these texts forevermore. They will never be lost. You know, printing is God's gift to us to save letters, 
Um, and they are making big volumes, heavy volumes, long lasting volumes. The Gutenberg Bible survives, you know, in a third of the copies in which it was printed about 50 out of 150, which is a tremendous survival rate because it was a sacred text, because it was a big text, a heavy text, hard to destroy, valuable, although it didn't become a collectible commodity, really, you know, the, the, the hotness of the Gutenberg Bible, you know, really starts in the early 19th century. But um, nevertheless, it, it um, survived very well. People like to own it. So, um, yeah, the, the, the community had multiple impacts. Another one of those impacts, of course, is the overabundance of books, the complaint that there are too many books, that there are too many bad books, that, you know, we can't keep up, we can't read them all. And then, of course, as I documented too much to know, printing is the medium in which people devise solutions to this problem, which are indexes, bibliographies, um, you know, ways of sorting books into thematic headings so you can find your way around. Um, and it just, of course, spirals even more, more books created to manage this problem, much as we experience today. Thank you so much. Um, yes, this insight about mimicry as an initial impulse, um, I, I find, um, I find is one that you brought to me and it and then you start to see it everywhere. So um, so thank you for that. And also in this chapter, there are just um, many moments where it's just daunting the amount of erudition that goes into counting up <laughs> the books that um, still survive, might have been lost, et cetera, et cetera. So that, um, uh, yeah, it's a really remarkable uh, manifestation of work that's been going on for decades. I'll also, for people interested in this, um, and publicly, thank you so much for making your course on printing and manuscript in the early modern world available online. I have used those documents in my own teaching, and I'm grateful to, um, to you for sharing them. Um, all right. The, this book has an impressive chronological sweep. And so moving far forward in time, Chapter 13, which is entitled Search, talks about how Two graduate students um, in 1998 at a scientific conference delivered a paper called The Anatomy of a Large-Scale Hypertextual Search Engine, um, and in which they presented um, a model for finding things on the emerging World Wide Web. Those graduate students were Sergey Brin and Larry Page, and their um, and the company, and they ended up founding a company we've all heard of, Google. Um, in that paper, um, or uh, Bryn and Page have talked about how they took inspiration for their searching program from academic citation and footnotes. Tony, in 1997, a year before they delivered that paper, you published a book called The Footnote, A Curious History. And could you please explain for us how this convention from the humanities helped provide a logic that inspired Google searching. Yeah, that's, uh, of course, had I but known, I could have asked for royalties. But now, of course, uh, they didn't know my work and no reason that they should. So I think the 90s was a, looked at in retrospect as we can, was a real transitional period uh, in terms of research, for example. It was the, the once the World Wide Web came live, it became possible to find things out in a way that had never been possible before as, for example, the first the computer library catalogs that had been going for a while came online. Uh, and you could you could actually, um, I remember I was in Germany for a year in 93, 4, and again in 98. And the transformation by 98 was really dramatic. And what you could look up from Europe and across Europe that you wouldn't have been able to do five years before. Uh, and uh, five years before, I had been at a wonderful German research institute in Berlin, uh, which had highly skilled librarians who phoned and faxed all over Europe to get the books that the fellows needed. And by 98, that was already a kind of very beginning to be an obsolete culture. Um, you would not you would be emailing and you would be able to find much more already online before you sent the mail. So that was uh, it was a moment of change and transition. 
And it was also a point when, um, I mean, the point of Anne's great book, uh, Too Much to Know, is that we always think there's too much to know. And then, you know, many, many periods people have complained about this. But by the 90s, there was really a lot to know. Um, there, uh, there had just been explosions of research in so many fields, journals spawning other journals, subdisciplines spawning others. And the search engines were really not good. Um, search, you know, we were beginning to get things listed online, bibliographies were going online, but you couldn't, if you tried with Yahoo and Alta Vista and, uh, and was it Metacrawler and the other ones that were, you just didn't find anything very useful. And this was the, the brilliance of Bryn and Page was to think in terms of formal citations, um, because that gives you a higher level of knowledge. Of course, when they, def- when Google devised Google's. Scholar that gives you a more concentrated and still more reliable level of knowledge. Now, how well footnotes and citations work? That's the funny thing, because my book was really meant to historicize the footnote and suggest that footnotes, um, though they do allow you to retrace the way a text has been built to some extent, and that was the idea that I had in common with Bryn and Page. Um, uh, but I also argued that footnotes have a rhetoric, that they developed over time, that they have many limitations, that they're often not wholly um, scientific, wissenschaftlich, they're, they're, they're often aimed to make polemical points. And these are all things which, which Bryn and Page had to ignore um, if they were even conscious of them in order to build their system, which basically had to use all citations as the same kind of citation. Uh, but certainly the, you know, there was, I think we were facing common problems, the explosion of knowledge, which in the sciences was much bigger, um, it, because there was an international scientific Anglosphere already. So American scientists could use work done in Europe, much of it already done in English, if they could only find it. Uh, and that was the, you know, that was one of the problems they had, they had come up with a way of, you know, certainly radically and quickly solving. The other thing that I suspect was on their minds was the um, citation index culture, which was already highly established in science, um, that uh, in the sciences and in the social sciences now, it's pretty established that you, you take, um, articles or that are cited many, many times are more important than articles that are cited only a few times. Uh, in the humanities, this is a very problematic idea because um, great articles get forgotten. Um, it also tends to push writing in English over writing in anything else. Um, since no, you know, since the English dominates the World Wide Web and it di- dominates digital media, particularly as we experience them in the United States, so uh, there are problems with that too. But I think that was the other thing on their mind, and indeed now you can go to Google Scholar and get your H index and other indications of where you stand in the world of learning and how it changes day by day. Uh, you know, and that I think was not on my mind at all. I was you know, I was interested in other things, but I think there was a common kind of massive wrenching transition going on, um, which would eventually leave faculty no longer doing much of their research in libraries. Um, it would, we, we, you know, mostly the PC took us back to our offices and by the time we got laptops, um, we were out of the habit of going to the library, particularly as so much more material was available online. So I often see my students in the Princeton library, but I never see colleagues and, and the colleagues that I know who work there all say the same thing. They never see colleagues there. Uh, even though it's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful um, institution at Harvard because you have those great library studies. I suspect faculty are perhaps still more in Widener than they were, but uh, but so that was that was one of that was happening in the '90s. I mean, there were massive changes, and I think that made us conscious that the way we did things had a history. And that, that's one of the reasons why scholars started looking back. A wonderful young scholar at Oxford has just wrote a couple of years ago a terrific book on the index. And again, historicizes the index. So these, these are all things that I think began suddenly to look interesting in the 90s. Thank you. On this topic of getting to the library, if, if I could, um, 
as you've alluded to nowadays, it's possible to write books without even going to the library. Um, and could I ask you um, both or either or both to say a little bit more about how you as historians, professors, members of intellectual communities regard this development in, I think? Well, it, with some trepidation, I mean, you need to know what you're doing before you rely on digitized books. And so I really try to take all of my classes into the Rare Book Library to handle some books and get a sense of what it looks like when you digitize, you know, a, a page that has bleed through, for example, or that has a splotch because it's an ink blot or a, you know, a problem with the paper. And then that's going to become a black mark on your, uh, on your PDF or your scan. Uh, and of course, it's only through, is mainly through contact with the books themselves that people's passions get sparked. So I'm a firm believer in, in putting people in touch with the books physically uh, in their in their training, in their coursework, and so forth. And then, of course, you're ready when COVID hits, you know, to operate with digitized text. And I have to say, I was supremely grateful for the fact that early printed books are very heavily digitized, uh, thanks to European projects, thanks to American projects, library projects, national projects, uh, the USCC links to them. There are all these collective catalogs. Uh, Carlsruhe Virtuelo Catalog is a big favorite of mine that shows you which ones exist in PDF and so forth. So I think we need both. Uh, and of course, it's it's a huge plus that we can look at multiple copies at the same time. I remember the huge headaches of trying to, you know, put two copies together that are even within the same library, but in two separate reading rooms. Um, you know, now we don't need to do that anymore. We can take photographs or we can have a digitized copy. And then even through digitization, we can often see multiple copies digitized from different collections all on your computer and then compare that, say, to the copy you have in front of you in your local library. So yes, we need we love the digitization, of course, but we definitely need to make people aware of the books themselves and how they operate, how they're things. Uh, which are, you know, vulnerable to loss and change over time, all the hands they've been through, the way they've been rebound, possibly reordered, separated, put together, all kinds of strange things happen in the hundreds of years between the time they were first produced and the time we're looking at them now. Yeah, thank you. Um, one story um, for me that drove home that um, it pays to go to the library was that a few years ago, I was working on an article trying to argue that there was a persistent ambivalence about the border between Europe and Asia um, well into the 18th century. And I spent a bunch of time looking a bunch of time looking at a bunch of maps, including those of the Vogandy Atlas. And then I was able to get into the Rauner archive and look at, lo and behold, the table of contents, which shame on me, I had neglected um, um, on not a separate sheet, but just the book cover itself. Um, and found that there where it listed a table of contents, it had Europe with a question mark and Asia with a question mark, which I just found to be terrific evidence for helping to argue that there was ambivalence about the boundary between Europe and Asia. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, if I could, um, and I wanted to ask you a question as someone who has, you know, in too much to know, you talk about how people experience and manage um, information overload. And we live in a moment now where people are talking about overload saturation so much. Um, you know, we, you're both too fine of historians to try and corner into making simplistic analogies, et cetera. I don't want to do that. But I, I do want to know if you... Um, could um, maybe with your historical perspective, do you, what do you, um, commonalities or differences that you see about managing information? Um, you've talked about all these apparatuses have been developed that help with that. Um, are there other things you'd like to say about that? Thanks. No, of course, it's a question that when constant mulls over, that's why we do history. You know, we, we bring to the past questions that come from our current experience. And we try, of course, then to forget about where we are now to under appreciate what it meant at the time. And then we come back to the present. So thank you for this great question. I'd say one very different um, part of the experience of overload today is that everybody has it. I mean, the number of, you know, 
items in a hardware store or the number of choices of any product and you go online and you have to navigate this, whatever discipline you're in. Whereas, you know, my folks who were moaning about this in the 16th and 17th centuries are mainly scholars who have access to good libraries because at the same time as they're complaining about overload, there's also underload. <laughs> there are plenty of people who don't have access to the books they want to get access to. And even in overload, you have, as you do with the Google search, you're still not finding what you want. You know, you can have tremendous overload and yet not get what you want. So it's always uh, a dynamic. Uh, and of course, so first of all, everyone's experiencing overload, I think much more widely rather than a scholarly elite, basically. The, another big difference, I think, is that, you know, as Tony was saying, every time you search, the web is completely unstable. And I remember sort of realizing this. And not only that, but how your computer responds to something is also unstable because of all the software and the wetware, and all the stuff you've got. So you really never step into the same search twice, uh, which has me kind of hoarding. You know, whenever I find something good, I try to screenshot it or download it or, you know, save it and record it because I'm not sure I'll be able to find it again. You know, even going into my history and clicking on the same link, it might be different. So that's quite different from the early modern experience where everything is in printed books. There may be, there are, as people have shown, you know, some variations between the copies of a print run, but by and large, it's the same book and is not going to change. You know, some of these reference books were in use for over a hundred years. We can see them being purchased and used and cited. And that kind of stability is just obviously um, with something we don't have. Um, I have to say, I so of course, I actually use DuckDuckGo these days, um, and I like to not settle for what the search dishes up on the front page. You know, go go deeper in to see the kinds of things. There's so much repetition. You know, all these sort of I don't know what they are. They're paying for something, or they're all repeating each other. And it's, so you have to get past the the, the compilation mode. Um, and then the other thing is I appreciate a good library catalog because library cataloging is controlled vocabulary developed in the late 19th century, the professionalization of librarianship. And, you know, that too changes over time. What are proper cataloging terms? But it's, it's a brain that has decided to sort your book in a certain way. And so that's powerful in addition to keywords. I mean, it's true that sometimes a Google search will get you where you want to go faster, especially because it has fuzzy search. And even a high quality uh, library catalog like Harvard's, which is open to the public, hollis.harvard.edu, I highly recommend it, doesn't have fuzzy search. So that's very annoying. Um, so you need both, I would say. Um, but the work that librarians, and as you pointed out earlier, it's generations of people who have um, been contributing to the sorting and the classification of books in library catalogs. Creating metadata is very powerful, and it's very sad, honestly, that Google Books basically ignores the metadata. So you might find a cool thing on Google Books, but you really want to know what you're looking at. You should go into a library catalog and watch all the, you know, the special that talks about the size and talks about where it was printed and how many editions and weirdness as of them, you know, that there was an error here or a defective something or other. All that in a well-cataloged entry will will uh, become more clear. So I think we need a complement. We need to use, you know, web searches plus a good library catalog. And for that, we need librarians. And revenues, I mean, we need to support our libraries. <laughs> here, here. Um, you know, thinking about this and um, how you mentioned that you never step into the same search twice, you know, um, it, it it's links with one of the things that's been going through my mind as I've read this volume, and that is this sort of um, proposition has uh, occurred to me that I want to ask you to put before you and ask you to respond to or critique, say that's ridiculous or that's on the right track or, you know, just for the sake of conversation. And um, and it also deals with what we as historians do. And this is what um, has kind of been coming up in my head that as historians, we are hamstrung in understanding the past by privileging the written record and that Google searches are hamstrung in reflecting reality by their re reliance on linkages between web pages to say nothing of profile customization. Um, and yet, historians, Google searches, um, both arguably, arguably, despite these shortcomings, often return something worthwhile. 
discuss. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we're, we're stuck with the word. I don't think we're always stuck with the written word. In the 20th century, you get more and more recorded interviews and uh, other ways, you know, and even in the 16th and 17th century, you get the table talk of scholars, which can often, you know, which their students recorded and published, and which can often be immensely rewarding. So I, I think, you know, you know, I know there, there's also been a material turn in historiography um, recently, my college roommate, now a re- retired distinguished professor of archaeology, likes to point out that he's only been doing these things for the 50 years since we were both trained at the University of Chicago, and it's great historians have stumbled onto what archaeologists have been doing for generations. He's really pleased to welcome us. That's, I think, the the propaganda for all that it's it's always that way you know you say we have a new method it'll do everything and and then you know you take your two feet of beach and that's that's what you occupy for the rest of time however that apart i think we are stuck with the word i don't you know at this point we don't have many other ways of doing work and even if you're working on things you need the words to understand how people received them examined them worked on them there's a a wonderful book called Painting in Stone by an art- architectural historian, Fabio Barry, which is a study of the way colored stones were used in architecture from antiquity down through the Renaissance. And he's a very expert at both the technical aspects of what you can do with what kind of stone and what the patterns are meant to do. And he has a wonderful eye, but he's also read everything that can shed light. And it's often the comments in a in a contract between an architect and a patron or a treatise or a visitor that gives you an actual understanding of what was happening what was in the mind of the architect and passed on to the the stonemasons who did the work so yeah i think we're we're stuck with the word and uh, you know it's going to be hard to get past it um, my friend spent a lot of his life analyzing fossilized human manure and you know that you know in a world without words, which are you know, caves, um, a lot of that is preserved and it can tell you incredible things about diet and living conditions and so on. But I, I think I'm happy enough not to have um, fossilized human manure from my period and to work with my documents and books instead. So, you know, I agree we are hamstrung. There are things we'll never be able to touch. And already in the 16th century, as the flood of books came out, people were saying, you know, they make decisions in courts. And the reasons why they're doing things are never stated in public. There's no way we're ever going to know why Henry VIII decided to take his church out of the Universal Catholic Church, because we can make how we can make theories, but there's no record of what was on his mind. He talked to his key advisors, Thomas Cromwell and others. We don't know what they said. And there's a whole literature in the 16th and 17th centuries already of people saying, in the end, you can't do rigorous political history because you just can't know the grounds on which the good and the great made their decisions. So yes, we're in some ways, we're always baffled, we're always hindered. But I do think that the great advantage we have now, which Anne has already referred to, is that if you keep the library and search, if you use, use them in a in complementary ways, it gives us a kind of power that you've never had before. Just the possibility of sitting in a rare book or manuscript room, looking at one text in front of you, and as you can in almost all major libraries and archives now, being able to call down secondary work, comparanda, other versions, and have them on your screen at the same time. That is a kind of research that really wasn't possible before, what, 10, 15 years ago, and it gets easier and more productive practically day by day. So I, I do think that, you know, it's true. There are there are limits. We can't go beyond. My father was a political journalist, and uh, he was always had, when I talked to him about these 16th century skeptics, he said, yeah, that's what we would always say at the, at the New York Post, which was still a newspaper when he was editing its editorial page. You know, you know in the end, they were watching the Roosevelt and the New Deal. And, you know, in the end, we don't know what Roosevelt says to Harry Hopkins or Harry Hopkins says to FDR. Um, so, yeah, the, those things are, are narrow limits on what we're ever going to know about the past. Thank you. 
staying with this job of um, with this theme of the historical um, the historian's job, um, I want to ask about continuity and discontinuity. Um, from your perspective, which technologies or practices do you see as having the greatest continuity over the long durée of the history of information? And conversely, where do you see the greatest ruptures, both in innovations and obsolescence? Thanks. That's a great question. I love to pose that question to my students on the first day of class. You know, what is the oldest technology that you use? So, you know, some people, obviously they're speaking, <laughs> and and that in itself is goes way back, and we so far back that we really can't document it. But we can agree on speech, the capacity to communicate. Um, then you know, so people then English, of course, is super recent. You know, medieval. Um, and then the oldest, and then there's writing, three thousand five hundred uh, years, you know, before the Common Era, roughly. Writing props up in different places. Uh, so of the th kinds of things we use, you know, it's the Roman alphabet. Let's say that's 700 before the Common Era, you know, coming off of the Etruscan alphabet. So these are some of the, th the things that, you know, are very long lived um, and um, presumably will continue simply because they're so deeply ingrained uh, in a large part of the world, though, of course, not everywhere. The other thing that has struck me recently is the sort of the shape of the page. It is what your visual field sees easily between, you know, your two hands right in front of you, this kind of, and that is sort of the size of a column on a papyrus roll, a page opening in a codex, uh, a clay tablet is smaller, but it's still going to fit in that. And in that sense, there's some sort of basic human uh, unit of uh, what we see easily, uh, which I think is also, you know, very durable. I'll, I'll uh, let Tony talk about ruptures. Yeah, um, and you know, and I, I agree with that. You know, it's it's striking. Newspapers have been online for quite a while now, but it's really taken to the last couple of years for, say, the New York Times to start experimenting with articles in which there's a big visual element in which quotes are pulled out artfully, and, and I find it really annoying. I'd much rather just have the old columns, but that's because I'm old and uh, and don't see the point. But you know, they people were blathering about how new web design was for decades when all it was was a ribbon of text between two big columns of ads which was the which was the format invented in the 19th century to make magazines cheap after in the later 19th century before that periodicals were very expensive and limited to a small group of elite buyers who could afford them and in the later 19th century all over the west the western world they figured out that if you got advertisers to pay for advertising you could make a magazine much cheaper and, and have much larger editions. And that's what the web did at first. I and mean, now we're really starting to see an independent kind of design developing there, but it's taken a lot longer than the propaganda suggested. Um, certainly there are big ruptures. Um, one rupture is I still had, and I think Anne still had, a very traditional kind of education where I learned French by taking dictations and writing very very, very precisely prescribed explications of short passages of text. I learned Latin and Greek with a lot of memorization, not just of grammar, but actual memorization of passages and repetition of them. Uh, in, and that was a form of education which in some way con connects us to Erasmus in the Renaissance, to Lupus of Ferrier in the Carolingian period, to Cicero. They all learned in more or less that way. And that's a tradition which is pretty much broken now. Um, you know, in England, uh, in France, the great secondary schools now make it very hard, if not impossible, to do Latin and Greek, uh, both at the same time, which was at the core of elite education in both countries through the, certainly through the end of the 20th century. Um, the, you know, the, wonderfully, the Italian government still provides a superb classical education in the Lice, in the Lice Classici, which exists not only in, in northern cities, which are rich like Bologna or, or, or Milan, but in Sicily, where very little else works in the public realm, you can get a fantastic tradition 
traditional education and get through exams to the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, which is the, the high academic school of all of Italy, which actually has disproportionately more Sicilians and Southerners than it should by numbers. Uh, it's an incredible thing, but it's practically just Italy which is doing this. Everywhere else, this education, which was Shakespeare's education, Descartes' education, not that he liked it very much, um, Voltaire's education, uh, Robespierre's education, this is, a, this is gone. And that's a huge difference. Many of my students who have really good Latin now learn it by going to um, a, an organization in Frascati outside Rome where you live, they, they give you free room and board and you speak only Latin for a year of Latin classes held in Latin. And by the end of that, you're a much better Latinist than you would be coming out of Princeton or Harvard with a Summa in Latin classics. Uh, because of the intensity of it, which does something to make up for the lack of all those years of hardwiring that you had in, in the old days. So that's a huge rupture in elite culture. Um, I think the um, the newspaper was itself a rupture in its foundation, the sort of regular provision of news in large quantities, um, as the wonderful um, as, as the wonderful uh, chapter in our book shows. Uh, you know, with four you know people going to the newspaper office to read the new uh, the new front page as it was posted several times a day, and the end of the newspaper um, as a, a daily thing has really changed that. And I think, you know, that was part of a much wider culture of adult life that once a day you opened a newspaper, whatever it was, and you took in stuff which a common sensibility had put together, whether it was um, high Episcopalian erudition like the old Herald Tribune, or whether it was all the news that fits we print like the Times, or whether it was headless corpse and topless bar like the Daily News or the New York Post. But you put something you put something to get you got something which was bundled together coherently aimed at you as supposedly at the sort of person that you were and that's that's gone we we do our own bundling our own bund again no two people are getting the same stream of information from the outside world i used to talk to friends about the article in the times or the new yorker but now it's complete chance whether people have seen that particular article in the mix of times articles that they read on their tablet that morning um, so, uh, and I think that that's, that's been a huge change and, and uh, not a change for, you know, in some ways, a change that makes political argument and political discussion very different. Um, the other thing I would say, um, and maybe we'll go into this more a little later, is I think our tolerance for just facts is much less than it was. Uh, you know, the expectation of an editor at, say, the New Yorker or the New York Times um, for what people will be willing to take in in a single article is about a third of what it would have been in the 1960s. And of course, there would have been more articles. So in some way, there has been a real rupture in how much we're willing to take in, in a gulp by reading about the world outside us. Now that, you know, that itself is a rupture in a culture which has a history which came into being in the late 19th century, but still that, that's a big change and, uh, and seems to me, uh, you know, in some ways, one that we, we don't, haven't really come to terms with yet. And it's one that affects everybody in a modern society. Uh, certainly. Oh, thank you. This raises so many points, and I, um, I will resist the temptation to go in many different directions. And um, but and go come back to the book. And I want to talk about chapter eleven, which is um, a chapter by Heidi Twardik and Richard John that talks about. Um, it's centered mostly on the um, first half, late nineteenth century, first half of the twentieth century, and it talks a lot about newspapers and about radio, if I'm not mistaken, and. Um, uh, um, uh, this piece cuts so so many ways. You mentioned facts, um, and one of the um, moments in that article that I even um, had jotted down because it just struck me as um, an American living in twenty first century, the two thousand twenty two, um, was this remark by a journalist from nineteen forty five who wrote, 
facts, facts piled up to the point of dry certitude was what the American people then needed and wanted. Um, and it, it strikes me as an American who's watched these um, hearings um, put on by the committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the Capitol and spends time talking to um, my relatives, some of whom support Trump, that it um, that facts aren't enough for some people. And I, um, and I wanted to know if, uh, in, in some ways, how does your historical perspective inform how you understand this? And if I could tag on just a little bit um, some other moments of this article and then just ask you both to respond a little bit. The article, um, they also go into talking about um, how contemporary Americans in um, interwar in the interwar period commented on, on how effective German radio was under Hitler. Um, they write, quote, among the Nazis' most effective policies was their systematic denigration of all non-Nazi information outlets as false and all non-Nazi um, information providers, including journalists, public figures, and even celebrities, as liars, end quote. Um, uh, could you uh, say, uh, could you respond to that, that article and, and share your take? Well, well, thank you. I think you really uh, brought out themes there, which I hadn't connected. I mean, of course, the time at which we wrote was different from the time at which we're reading now. Um, so what strikes me is that in order for facts to be impactful or meaningful to people, they have to sort of be in a state of equanimity, a, a state of a willingness to take them in. And if you're in a state of emotional you know, great upset, as frankly, it seems like we all are all the time nowadays, who cares about facts? I mean, you just have to, you know, get validation for your emotion and articulate that emotion. That's, of course, what I like about our discipline, especially, you know, focusing on the early modern period, which is kind of in the past, is that it, it takes you out of your present and it has you with much more equanimity thinking about moments of extreme tension back then. I mean, you know, the wars of religion and uh, they, they, these humanists were extremely worried about people denouncing them, spying on them, you know, claiming they had written something when they hadn't, uh, et cetera. So these phenomena have been around a long time. Uh, sadly, when they are in our present, you know, I can, under, I can see why facts aren't what's appealing because you have to sort of have a certain confidence in you know, stability of the future, of the state of things now, in order to step out of your emotional state and and be receptive to facts. That would be my, and I worry that, yeah, that doesn't happen often enough. I would want to point out on um, the ruptures about Tony's point, yes, uh, for the memorization and the, there are some benefits perhaps, or some new elements to education if it's well done, which is the idea of questioning authority, the idea of a critical attitude, um, which I didn't get any of <laughs> in my, you know, I, it was about it was about memorization. It was about uh, appreciating authority and and um, and re sort of participating in, you know, transmitting it. So when it's well done, I think um, thinking for oneself is an important value. That I'm not so sure was highly present in a traditional education. Um, I think maybe, you know, it's always varied by individual teacher pupil relationships and parent child relationships as well. Um, so, but now of course there's a worry that, um, this value of, you know, people, sh students should be able to be exposed to many positions. And what they're really about is the educational experiences about formative coming to their own conclusions based on a wide variety of sources of information, of experiences with critiquing information with guidance, uh, and then doing it on their own. Uh, but in fact, as Tony's saying, we're all exposed, we're all making our own bundling, but actually we're not doing it super thoughtfully. In many cases, we're just, you know, grabbing onto the bundle that someone else has, some influencer has packaged for us. So it's, it's concerning. 
I mean, I think that this is right. American, my daughter is a high school teacher, and her view is that's what American education is meant to do. It's meant to socialize you and teach you to try to be a thinking person rather than to convey facts and skills, at which it's not very good by comparison with more um, tracked elite systems of education in Europe. I mean, we can't do the kind of thing in high school that Soviet Russia could do. Uh, for example, for the people in the top tracks. And uh, we used to, and when in the 90s, when they started coming here for college, you know, you'd meet these students who were majoring in physics and doing a minor in Greek and read more Greek better than anybody in the classics department and played Chopin on the piano to abuse themselves. Uh, you know, we don't, you know, American education has never been designed to have that kind of impact on people. The worry I have, because, you know, I agree, we, you know, we, you know, this is, a, you know, it's not as if we're going to turn the clock back, even though there are these classical charter schools forming, which are not not something I view with a lot of uh, hope. Um, you don't know where you come from. And the thing about the old system was that for at least a limited number of people, you knew where you came from. Whereas I see our path now as being a way of, of teaching people, you know, we're trying to be the university from nowhere. We don't want to pr- we don't want to put any preference on learning about America or learning about Europe or learning about whatever the West was, and you know I understand the reasons for not prioritizing them, but I do think we come from a particular set of historical developments, and I don't think it's a good idea for people not to know something about them. And I'm afraid it is true that more and more our students don't know something about them uh, because of the kind of education that they've had um, didn't provide it. And this is made more complicated by the fact that some of our best students now at uh, elite private universities are students from very far away, um, brilliant students from China, from Korea, from Taiwan, from uh, Thailand, from Cambodia, um, who you know have perfect American-sounding English, and you you know you tell an American joke, and they look at you and says, "I'm sorry, you know, I grew up in Cambodia. I have no idea what you're talking about." Uh, you know, and that's wonderful. They're a huge force for good in our universities, and I just wish we had more of them. But that, to me, complicates the question of what it is we should be giving as a foundation, and nobody in authority is thinking of it that way. So that that's my worry. I, you know, I don't want to turn the clock back, but I don't think we're being very thoughtful in how we're turning the clock forward. And, and that really does worry me a bit. The other thing that strikes me is this is something that I think starts with radio. This is one of the things I really took away from Heidi and Richard's wonderful article is broadcast media are great at making people hate other people. They're not so good at making people want to join in something and do it together. Um, positive, you know, if you look at, for example, you listen to Father Coughlin, he sounds, you know, the, the American demagogue, uh, or Tailgunner Joe, that you can still understand how people found them really effective. Look at World War II American newsreels, and they're so propagandistic, and they, they, they give such a simplified and clearly um, even for war, pastel picture of the world most of the time, um, that they're not effective. Uh, and whereas, you know, so negative, whatever it is that radio has in common with what we're doing now, those media are really good at instilling you with the desire, the, the belief that other people aren't fully human, that they're plotting against you. Um, all those beliefs that come up in, in the witch craze, of which you, you sent us in that article, um, you know, the, that that gets reproduced again and again and again very effectively by broadcast media of every kind. And I think you were right. You mentioned in, in a follow-up email, you know, this happens in Athens with the, uh, the you know, the, the very, uh, the very demon, uh, and, you know, the very almost demonically uh, wild politics in Athens in the later part of the Peloponnesian War, you know, demagogues uh, really you know, getting immense power. Uh, and, uh, you know, and even when the war is over and this aristocratic group takes over, they then proscribe and kill fellow citizens, you know, a democratic pro, um, you know, precedent that would be followed in Rome. That's how Cicero dies. It's followed in the French Revolution. 
it's one of you know, one of the things that the American Revolution happily maybe they didn't know enough classics to know about that, but uh, I don't because I, I, I think they'd have done it if they'd known about it, but they didn't. Uh, at all events, you know, I think that uh, you know the, these media really work to make you make hate work. And you can see, you saw that, for example, in in Rwanda. Even though we now, I think we now know that the situation was much more complicated than it was presented in even the best American media when uh, the when the Tutsi and Hutu were fighting. Um, we now see that the the uh, the other the party that suffered in the civil war is now in you know in some ways doing the same to the others. You know, this is all these media have a terrifying power, and I think that is much more powerful than facts. But one last thing, if you ever see a broadcast news show from the 60s, it is just astonishing how much information is provided. You know, the assumption that everybody wanted an hour of solid local news and half an hour of national and international news from 6 to 7.30, you know, every weekday evening, uh, that's really a different world too. Uh, um, thank you so much. Um, thank you. And uh, along, um, following up on what you say about radio and its abilities, one of the points that um, uh, um, Heidi Torek and Richard John make in this article is that the, um, you know, we had newspaper and then radio came along, but newspaper didn't become obsolete. And then TV came along and, and the internet and radio didn't go away. Radio is still with us. And it seems like rural communities, um, have done a more, um, and certain segments of American society, the right, have been more proactive in um, maintaining radio um, messaging, perhaps. And did you want to um, say anything before? I'm, I'm, I see that time is getting short, so I, um, so let, if I could, let me move, um, let me move on if I, if I could. Um, in the book, there are two theorists that are mentioned again and again, and they are Jürgen Habermas, um, and another is Marshall McLuhan. And um, we don't have too much, uh, too, too much time. So I wanted to ask you maybe um, to just pick one, or each of you could take one if you wanted. Why are these theorists so important to the history of information? I'll take Habermas very briefly. And I think what Habermas did that was most important was just to dramatize the importance of communication, um, not just as a matter, uh, as something that's involved in literature or in religion, but as the basis of politics. I mean, he had this vision that down through the 18th century, you, you know, politics is basically this theatrical show, it's representation. And slowly, first in private life, and then with the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the changes in England, in public life as well, politics becomes a matter of debate, it becomes a matter of argument, it becomes a matter of presentation. So in a way that, you know, previous, previous German th theorists of communication were interested in, for example, hermeneutics. What, what is it we do when we think we're interpreting or understanding a text or another utterance? And what he said was, the whole process is tremendously important. It really matters that in the 18th century, people sit in coffee shops and read news, news sheets. This is new. This is a transformation in the way they're taking in the political world. And modernity comes out of that. And I think the way it, none of the specifics of his account are still accepted by many people, but he dramatized this process in an immensely powerful way. Uh, and he wrote pretty clearly, um, especially as German philosophers go, and you could be translated into English and read by non-specialists. So I think that that's really what's made him so important. Thanks. Yeah, Marshall McLuhan, of course, is a, a whole topic unto himself, and I'm no great expert, but, uh, you know, his famous line, which uh, the medium is the message. And I thought Ezra Klein's recent piece in the New York Times really brought home what is meant by that, that the medium isn't neutral. It isn't that there's content that you can put in, you know, whether it's television or radio or print, and it'll all be the same. It's that as you create a, a way of talking to people, and uh, he uses the example of cable news, you're going to have certain features 
of it. And, and pretty much whatever the content is of cable news, it is still going to operate in the same kind of way. Uh, you know, having obviously the emotional pitch, the, the various rhetorical moves. And, um, you know, that's, that's a really, obviously he spoke in aphorisms, which is another, another powerful way of sending a message long into the future. Um, and so the argument is that we should attend to how things are being presented, which is a question of medium technology. On the one hand, there's also genre and of course, you know, socio professional, all kinds of things shaping those genres. Um, and that that is, part of the impact of a message is is the medium itself and i think uh, he had other things to say about you know quite viewed as quite prophetic uh in the move away from broadcast where everybody is getting one message television is another broadcast form although now of course we experience so much fragmentation to the web which is all about consuming uh, in in echo chambers and tidbits and i think uh marshall McLuhan also deserves a lot of credit for having seen that well ahead of the internet even existing we're talking late 60s um and here we are you know after ezra klein i thought was nice and talking about the enthusiasm for the web and of course they're tremendously beneficial i mean wikipedia is just a gift it's so amazing to be able to find stuff you know so easily and reliable stuff i remember the days when if you didn't know the date you know to put in a lecture or whatever you had to go hunting you know, you had to find the multi-volume reference book, you had to go to the library, you had to find the specialized article that would have the piece of information you wanted. Um, and, and now, you know, we do have lots of facts at our disposal. It's just that we need to be in a position to use them. And, Thank uh, you so much. Um, very well said. We, um, if I could, I'll ask one final question before I let you go, which is a convention in New Books Network. And that is to ask you, what are you working on now? or next? And maybe you'll go first. Sure. So I'm returning to a project uh, that uh, I first spoke about in the Rosenbach lectures in 2013 or something, but I've been working around. It's basically in, the, in these intervening years, it's basically who are and the helpers, the people whom uh, scholars worked with without typically acknowledging them, ranging from family members to uh, students, uh, servant pupils is a common term used in Erasmus scholarship, and then paid helpers, amanuenses, hand helpers. So I'm interested in zeroing in on a few relationships we can talk about in more detail um, to, you know, what kinds of people these were, what was the nature of the relationship, which was hierarchical, but also very intellectually and socially intimate. You know, they'd spend long hours together. They'd often live in the same house. Um, and so that's my plan to write a book about this. Thank you. And Tony, you? Uh, well, I'm finishing a book which I um, let go several years ago. I simply got interested in other things, which is on um, learned magicians in Renaissance Europe. There's a kind of moment in the late 15th and early 16th century when a vision crystallizes thanks to Pico della Mirandola, Marsilio Ficino, and a few other people, Henry Cornelius Agrippa, that it's possible to be a learned benevolent magus who can use the powers of nature. Uh, and uh, I try to historicize this more than has been quite done in the past, though there, there's wonderful work on this by uh, you know people from the great Francis Yates and Eliza Marion Butler, who are wonderful scholars, down to Brian Copenhaver, who's a good friend who's been working on magic his whole career, and, and others now. But I'm just trying to look at this one little group and this thing they call magic and understand why they thought and why their readers thought that what they were doing was plausible. So I'm setting it in the context of theatrical technologies that instilled wonder uh, of a world in which relics were infused with power and could you know do miracles and I'm, tr I'm really trying to um, you know not to pull it out which I think is what intellectual historians have done from that larger context but to set it back in that context and see if, if that helps 
see why these these things seemed uh, seemed probable seemed plausible. It's uh, I'm not looking at alchemy. Alchemy is the one bit of this which, thanks to a group of great historians, uh, um, Larry Principe, Bill Newman, and others, we now know worked. I mean, the reason people were in reason Newton and, and Locke and Boyle were still interested in alchemy was it was metallic crystal in chemistry. It could do lots of things. If you understood how to read alchemical works, you could go to a bench and actually do the things they told you and cool things happened. So that's not a question anymore. So I'm interested in the other kinds of magic, the magic that used the aid of angels, that used the aid, aid of thaumaturgic magic, that used the aid, aid of rituals, um, things which, you know, on the whole, I believe, didn't work. So if you read my book, you'll find out how it was possible to do the Renaissance bat signal and write on the face of the moon. I look forward to reading it. That sounds fascinating. And um, inserting kind of the labor and the layers into higher learning also sounds fascinating. So I will look forward to both of those. And um, in conclusion, I want to thank both of you. I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your work, which is um, excellent and detailed and has perspective and really just sets a model. And I also want to thank you for um, both of you, to my mind, really exemplify what a scholar teacher is. And despite your excellent and intense scholarship, um, I um, understand you both to be um, such committed teachers. You never got too cool for school, as they, as they might say. And I, um, so I thank you for your generosity as teachers and for the example you set and for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you.